Hi, I'm Brad Wilcox, and I'm a non-resident visiting scholar here at the university, here at AI, a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia, and the Future of Freedom Fellow at the Institute for Family Studies. I'm also joined tonight by my colleague, Dr. Wendy Wong, who is the director of research for IFS. And we're talking tonight about the connection between the success sequence and the American dream for black, Hispanic, and disadvantaged young adults uh, here uh, in America. I wanted to also let everyone know that they can um, submit questions by email to peyton.roth at AI.org, um, and can also question us on Twitter with the hashtag success sequence. So you can kind of reach out to us um, both by email and uh, on Twitter uh, as well. So hypocrisy is the homage that vice pays to virtue, a noted Rochefoucauld uh, more than 300 years ago. And its point, of course, was that people often stand for the right thing in public, um, even when they don't practice the sort of the right thing in private. But when it comes to the family culture of the American ruling class, this idea has been turned on its head. Today, too many of our Silicon Valley titans, media moguls, and C-suite executives, the men and women who control the commanding heights of our culture, or it might be called inverted hypocrites. What I mean by that is that in their own private lives, they embrace a family-centered way of life, aimed and oriented around marriage and parenting. But when it comes to kind of executing their public responsibilities for elites like Netflix Reed Hastings, it's a different matter. And we can kind of see this dynamic playing out in a variety of different contexts. So in California, for instance, Dr. Wang and I recently did um, a report called State of Contradiction. And in that report, looking at data from uh, YouGov, we found that more elite Californians embraced a public ethic centered around family diversity, this idea that we should kind of be embracing all different types of family structures. But when it came to kind of their own private lives, they were much more likely to embrace an ethic of putting marriage before the baby carriage. And as the data here to my right and left uh, indicates, they're also much more likely to be forging strong, stable families um, for themselves and for their children. So again, they were kind of talking left and walking right um, in their approach to, to this issue. And this kind of pattern is playing out not just in California, of course, but also in schools, public schools and universities across America, uh, in the mainstream media and in the pop culture, where either what you often have when it comes to family culture is a kind of silence around uh, the importance, say, of marriage, or where you've got a message that deliberately contradicts uh, this idea that family life should be grounded and guided uh, by marriage. And you know this matters because we live in a culture that is increasingly divided uh, along class lines when it comes to family life, where more educated and affluent Americans are forging strong and stable marriages, and more poor and working class Americans are struggling to do likewise. And what we see in the research is that culture is part and parcel of this growing marriage divide that differences in culture between more educated and affluent Americans and between working class and poor Americans help to explain in part uh, this divide. And more concretely, too many young adults today don't realize, don't know how much marriage matters um, for their own dreams for the future when it comes to both money and, uh, and their own future families. And that's in part because our elites and institutions that they control are not really telling them the truth about the facts of life. So what's needed today are new efforts to renew American family culture. And those efforts will incorporate, of course, um, initiatives to educate kids and young adults about the truths regarding marriage and family life, as well as efforts to equip them um, with the virtues and values they need to sustain strong and stable families. And so what this is gonna require are kind of efforts to work around um, the existing cultural institutions and to do things like producing new research, 
new school curricula, uh, working on social media, and also producing things like PSAs and videos that will kind of convey the truth about marriage and family life to the broader public and to young adults uh, in particular. So in that spirit, we're gonna be doing two things uh, tonight. Uh, one is uh, giving you a new report from Dr. Wong and myself, um, focusing on the links between the success sequence and the financial outcomes for young adults today uh, in their 30s. And then we're also gonna be giving you a preview of a new series uh, on the success sequence uh, that we're launching today. And we've got three videos, one for men, one for women, one for couples, that kind of give important um, stories um, that convey the truth about the success sequence uh, to a young adult audience. And we'll be previewing you the, uh, this video for uh, for young men uh, tonight. So then I'm gonna kind of turn over the stage to my colleague, um, Dr. Wong, to talk about a report that we've released today called The Power of the Success Sequence. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm so excited to be here and to talk about success sequence. And I remember actually five years ago, we did our first report and was right at the spot and talking about success sequence. I'm happy to be here. Um, and uh, so before I start, I want to show some social trends that we're experiencing today. So we all know that the birth out of wedlock is pretty high in America. On average, about 40% of the babies are born out of wedlock today, and there is a big racial divide here. As you can see, about 70% of the black babies are born out of wedlock, and the share is about 53% among Hispanic children, and the share is a relatively low among white children is about 28%. And it's interestingly, in the past 10 years, um, there's actually a downward trend among non-marital births among white children, but the same trend hasn't um, happened for black and Hispanic children. At the same time, um, children in America are experiencing the highest poverty rate among all Americans. As of today, about one in six children are in poverty, and black and Hispanic children are much more likely to be in poverty than other children. About 28% of the black children are in poverty today. So there is a real need for us to help children um, out of poverty, to help young adults to reach success. And we have a formula here. Um, it's called success sequence. And you're probably already familiar with it. Um, it involves three steps, getting at least a high school education, and working full time, and marrying before having children. So this was a concept um, initially. And uh, at Brookings, um, Bao Sawhill, and Ron Haskins did the first round of analysis. And Brad and I did analysis using a longitudinal data five years ago. Um, and then, so we have found strong evidence that success sequence works. So this is based on the National Longitudinal of Use Survey, 1997 cohort. So basically this is um, uh, young adults who were born in the 80s. They are the oldest millennials today. Um, so we are able to measure their education and their um, work status in their 20s, and then again, their um, financial outcome when they're in their 30s. So, so as you can see, um, for young adults who missed all the three steps, 52% of them are in poverty at mid 30s. And and then for those who graduated from high school but did not finish the other two steps, 27% of them are in poverty. But the share goes down quickly. Um, for uh, among the young adults who finish all three steps, 
only 3% of them are in poverty when they are in their 30s, which means 97% of them are out of poverty. Um, I don't have the slides here, but in fact, more than 80% of them who have finished all three steps are in the middle or upper class today. So since we have um, you know, published our report about success sequence, we got a lot of support. Um, but on the other hand, there are some skeptics and, and, and people are wondering, you know, is success sequence just all for the white children or white young adults and it doesn't really affect the minorities? Um, or, you know, there are severe structural factors. Can, you know, disadvantaged young adults overcome? Um, so this is the reason why we're doing our report today, because we really want to know whether success sequence help those disadvantaged young adults. So uh, we've looked at model factors, race and ethnicity, uh, family income, and family background. So first of all, um, so here is the result by race and ethnicity. As you can see, there are definitely stronger, strong uh, structural barriers for young adults from minority groups. So among those who did not finish any of the three steps, 73% of the black young adults are in poverty when they're in their 30s. 54% um, Hispanics are in their uh, uh, in poverty, and then only 40% of the white young adults are in poverty. So that means, like you know, even like for white young adults, even if they don't have a college education, they they don't have a full time job, and then they didn't marry before um, having baby. Um, well, you know, still sixty percent of them are not in poverty, but that's not not a story for black young adults. So we do see there are structural barriers here. Um, however, after completing each steps, this racial gaps dramatically reduces. So at the bottom, when you see the bottom bar, this is among all young adults who have completed the three steps. You can see the racial barriers are basically non-existent here. 96% of the black young adults who have finished the three steps are not in poverty when they are in their 30s. And then 97% uh, of Hispanic young adults are not in poverty. So um, this is really, really important finding here. Um, it shows that young adults from racial minorities can achieve success, um, you know, as long as they also follow the success sequence. Um, so similar story applies to income. As you can see that young adults from low income backgrounds um, face, also face structural barriers. And then about half of them who didn't finish the success sequence and are in poverty. But um, with each success sequence step up accomplished, the, their poverty rate is um, reducing dramatically. Um, for young adults uh, who have completed all three steps, even if they're from a low-income family, only 6% uh, of them are in poverty. So the same story applies to um, young adults from the non-intact families. Basically, in the data, we know whether they grew up in two-parent families. And so this, this is the young adults who did not grow up, grew up uh, with two parents. So there is an interesting finding about college education. Um, so as we know that College um, benefits young adults in many ways. Um, but on the other hand, we have a lot of talk about college debts being a burden. Um, so I was curious whether, um, you know, what happens for someone who only have a high school education, who did not go to college, what happens to them uh, if they follow success sequence? It turned out that success sequence really works. You know, it's amazing for the young adults who only have a college degree, but did not pursue, uh, uh, sorry, 
only have a high school education. They did not pursue college, uh, college but they got a full-time job and they married before having children. Their chance of being in poverty is only 5%. So 95% of them are not in poverty. Actually, more than 80% of them are in the middle or higher class. So this is a um, really encouraging finding, given that we know that not everyone goes to college today, and then uh, actually majority of the young adults are not in college. So as social, so as social scientists, we always wonder, OK, is it the behavior itself, or is it something related to the behavior that makes a difference? So that's why we run some regression models to test to see First, whether this order of marriage versus baby matters in terms of um, you know, young adults' economic success. And second, we, we measure the success sequence. So as you can see uh, here, I wish I have a pointer. Um, so basically, for young adults who marry um, first, their chance of being in the middle of higher income is twice as high as the young adults who had a baby first. And their chance of being in the poverty is, you know, 65% less uh, than the young adults who had a baby first. This is after control, a bunch of factors, including uh, working status, education, race, um, and even including their uh, family background and their intelligence. And then also for young adults who um, missed all of the uh, success sequence uh, steps, they are significantly more likely to be in poverty. Actually, there are, if you see, the coefficient is about, they're about like 11%, I'm sorry, 11 times more likely to be in poverty than the one, than the young adults who actually finished success sequence. So in conclusion, uh, following the success sequence is uh, associated with a much higher increase in the odds that for, mi for minority young adults to be economically successful uh, when they're reaching adulthood. So um, if young adults can overcome these barriers to education, work, and marriage, um, the American dream can be theirs. Um, for us, uh, we have a job to do, which is to help them to achieve this dream, help them to accomplish the three steps of success, of success sequence. Um, at the Institute of Family Studies, um, we are proud to present some of the videos we just made about success sequence and also a new website um, uh, that actually include all the relevant, relevant information about success sequence. So here, I'm going to play the first video. Does it work? How do I make it work? Being a father so early kind of threw me into this sink or swim situation. Everything that I was involved in at that point was almost like playing catch up because I had this kid I wasn't ready for, I was a teenager. Storms sometimes do sneak up on you, lightning storms. You just have to deal with what you have right then and there. Right now, we have a lot of drifting into parenthood. Almost half of all pregnancies in the United States are unplanned, unintended. We know that it's better at the front end of a relationship to take things slowly in terms of both sort of sex and the emotional connection with someone. A lot of young adults are moving quickly into sex, cohabitation, and parenthood. They haven't really figured out if they're a good fit for one another. We 
didn't have enough to go on foundationally to protect us from what, what would lie ahead. We had our trying times. We moved to a different state. We tried different jobs. We went from job to job. I had to feed the family with no money. We just have to spring. Having to get food like donated to us was, was the bottom of my life, really. just certain things that we couldn't deal with properly because I don't think the, the foundation was laid solidly enough. Childbearing is both incredibly important and incredibly difficult. Raising a child is a you know, 18, 20 year proposition. And most of those couples break up before the child is say five years old. Pretty soon you've got such a complicated family. We know that the relationships of unmarried parents are far more likely to break up. When parents' relationships fall apart, when parents go from one relationship to another, often adding more children, some related, some not, this can all be very hard on a child. Destructive and unstable relationships all take a toll on children. That's something people don't think about in the long term, of like the, the recurring problems that you have because of it. It could really affect your life in the worst of ways. Right now I'm starting over again, you know? I had a place that I could stay. For all intents and purposes, it was a trailer. I often think of like where I could have been had I not been struggling and I had that time to dedicate to my profession. Now you have different bills. Even though you have half custody or, or shared responsibility, whatever you want to call it legally, uh, there's still child support. There's still um, financial consequences. You have two homes to support now, whereas before you had two incomes with one home. If you knew that there were a series of decisions in your control, that data shows that 97% of the people who follow those decisions avoided poverty. And the vast majority entered the middle class or beyond. Would you want to know that? What the data tells us is that young adults today who put marriage um, before the baby carriage are about 60% less likely to be poor. We find repeatedly that you finish school, you get a job and you work, and you wait until marriage to start a family. There just are certain behaviors or certain series of behaviors that lead to likely different outcomes. biggest challenge really not conforming to what people wanted me to be not conforming to their values because mine doesn't match theirs not falling under peer pressure because that's really big in middle school I could have easily chosen to crumble to peer pressure crumble to do those decisions or people thought of me but I I saw the results I was getting I saw the long term I didn't just look at the momentary position choices of having children too early is one that you're going to have to play catch up with for the rest of your life. With the lifestyle we live now, sometimes we could be setting a future example for our children, whether it's good or bad. And I look at that and I don't want that for my children. I don't want them to fall under those temptations and, and not take their education seriously. I want to set a good example for my kids and so I choose to just stay away from that. If you understand the series of decisions and the probabilities associated with those decisions, that's the beginning point to help you think about your own life, to say, okay, I get it. I mean, this is the environment I'm in, but here's a pathway that others who are in the same situation, they chose, and look what those outcomes are. Our schools need to do a better job of providing vocational education to students who are not on the college track. Government policy needs to make work pay for all Americans. Schools need to give young adults guidance on how best to form good relationships. 
these are the kinds of steps that we need to make the success sequence a viable path for all young adults. So I wanted to express also at this point my um, gratitude to Michael Campo, who um, produced and directed uh, these three videos that are now on uh, the Success Sequence website, that again, uh, live at success-sequence.org um, as, uh, as of right now. Um, I'm pleased to welcome our panel um, tonight uh, for uh, our event, um, and we've been affected, as I think everyone has been for the last two years, uh, by COVID tonight. Um, we were going to have uh, Ian Rowe in person, um, but he is joining us online because of COVID. Um, and we we're going to have uh, Dr. Bell Sahil from the Brookings Institution join us tonight as well. Um, she, of course, is one of the stars of this new video, as is, as is Ian Rowe, and as is um, one of my other guests here tonight. Um, but Bell Sahil was exposed um, to COVID, well, not, well, she was, I think, exposed to COVID recently. Um, and so um, she's not able to join us in person tonight either. Um, but we do have, again, Ian Rowe um, on my right joining us virtually um, tonight. Um, and then we have uh, on my immediate right, uh, Dr. Catherine Pakulik, who is the Director of Social Research and an Associate Professor at the Bush School at the Catholic University of America is also in the video, um, joining us tonight to talk about the success sequence. Um, and then in the middle of, of our panel, uh, Delano Squires, who is a contributor to Blaze's uh, TV Fearless with Jackson Whitlock. And he has previously written for both The, the Root and The Federalist, among other uh, outlets. So we're very grateful to have them here uh, with us tonight to talk about um, the report, um, and the success sequence more generally, as uh, well as um, uh, the video. Um, the first thing I want to do in terms of beginning our conversation is to basically um, ask you to think about the unique role that marriage actually plays in the sequence when it comes to the economic welfare of young adults. Because I think, you know, when you're talking about the sequence, which tends to get a negative response in some precincts, people are really not arguing with the idea that education matters. They're not really arguing with the idea that work matters. It's that third step, you know, getting married before having kids that tends to cause some measure of controversy about the sequence. And so I'm gonna ask each of our panelists just to kind of weigh in briefly in terms of, you know, if how they're convinced basically that marriage per se is actually a big factor when it comes to um, 30 somethings uh, economic well being. And so, given that we're talking about economics, I'm going to turn the stage over uh, immediately to, uh, to our economist here tonight. Um, Catherine, what do you think about the sort of unique uh, impact, uh, the unique role that marriage plays in the economic welfare of 30 somethings today? Like, what's, what's the story from your perspective on that question? Thanks. That's a great question. I'm going to. Although I was introduced as the economist, I'm going to start by telling a quick story on this point. So my son is an 18-year-old, just finished his freshman year at a religious college. And um, he, in his first year, met the woman he would like to marry. You know, He'll kill me for saying this. But, um, but what was really interesting to me to observe, and of course we are a family that encourages marriage, encourages our children to grow up thinking about marriage. and. 
Um, he loves babies, you know, he'd love to have a family. But what's really interesting to me is how his messages to me started to change when he knew he wanted to marry somebody. You know, and it's going to be another year before her father wants to talk to him about marriage, right? But, oh, man, he's calling me saying, Mom, does my, does my tuition benefit apply to graduate school? I'm like, you're 18. Why are we thinking about graduate school, son? <laughs> well, because, you know, there's this program. I could do this program in Boston, and, you know, if I could get this tuition. I'm like, what are you? Well, it's because he wants to get married, and he's thinking back. It's a process of induction, and he's thinking, well, if I could show her father mm. that I have a plan mm -hmm. <laughs> by which, you know, I'm going to be very successful, um, he will trust me more. And we have worked through many permutations of this conversation. And, of course, a big piece of me is saying, you know, slow down and take advantage of your education now, right? But so that was really fascinating to me, see that in my own family. And I think that um, there's sort of two pieces of this, uh, which we end up seeing in the data, right? And one of them is, is the way in which um, marriage, in particular, because it is an institution that is forward-looking, uh, causes young people in the years where you're building your capital uh, to make plans for the future that are sensible. Mm -hmm. right? So that is the one piece, I think, which is quite clear economically, right? That thinking about the future is something that oftentimes 18-year-olds are not great at, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, they're thinking about their future in relation to something that's long-term. And that is tremendously powerful. I think that's one of the roles that marriage has here. The other thing I would say, which I think is super interesting, is that I think that young people are more powerfully motivated to do hard things for other people mm. than for themselves. And you say mm. to somebody, look, you know, if you do these three things, uh, you are not going to be poor. Okay, that's, that's interesting. If you do these three things, your kids will not be poor. And that, I think, is much more powerful. So, you know, I'm thinking about one of the most powerful lines I have I probably ever remember seeing in a, in a piece of research is this documentary that was produced now maybe 10 years ago about um, the public schools. It was called Waiting for Superman, Davis Guggenheim. And in the middle of that film, there is this great line where the interviewers are interviewing a 12-year-old boy. And they're saying, and he lives in D.C., minority community, and they're saying to him, why do you care so much about getting into this good school? And this 12-year-old, I mean, he's like a skinny little 12-year-old kid, and he says, well, I don't know, because I don't want my kids to have the life that I had. Mm. And the interviewer says, your kids? Like, you're, you're a kid. <laughs> like, why are you thinking about your kids? But I thought it was such an interesting um, kind of hit you in the face moment. You think, okay, people are very motivated by what they could give to other people. And that marriage is another institution where all of your efforts, in a sense, get uh, their blessings to other people. They come back to other people. And it kind of um, ropes you into this thing where all of, your, all of the good things that you, that you do um, are a gift uh, yeah. for somebody else. And I think that is more motivating yeah. um, in an interesting way. So those, for me, those yeah. are the two things. I think that's where the magic happens. Dawn, how about you? Sure. Um... When I think about marriage and its role in the success sequence, um, I think about it as the greatest structure, structural enabler of father involvement. Um, it's odd that it gets pushed back because <coughs> typically on the left, everything is about systems and structures until it comes to family structure mm -hmm. um, <laughs> or until it comes to value systems. Then they, they abandon that that type of framework. Um, and the reason it's, a, it's the greatest structural enabler for father involvement um, is because y you have one man who stands before family, friends, and, and if applicable, his God, and commits to one woman for one lifetime and everything that comes from that union. Mm -hmm. That is not the same as we're, you know, we're in a long-term relationship. And in 2022, long term could be <laughs> 30 years, it could be three years, it could be three months, right? That's, I like binary categories, so you're married or unmarried. Um, and, and I think the way that it's set up by design um, makes it so that, you know, marriage brings a certain level of stability 
to a family and, and to a household, that everyone in the household benefits. Mm -hmm. I think one of the issues with particularly the way we, we talk about family now is that it's almost a, a disembodied version of family mm -hmm. where we'll have fatherhood over on one side. Mm -hmm. But we don't talk about as much as the benefit that men and women have when they work in partnership together. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the father's benefit to his children, but it's also the husband's benefit to his wife and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, again, um, it, it's critically important right, because of the, the reasons that I listed but I also understand the pushback because um, many of the folks who may reject the su success sequence, even though they practice it in their own lives, mm -hmm. mind you, do so because they feel like um, we should not be moralizing and telling people what they should do. Um, and I think that's one of the major reasons why it's resisted as much as it is. Great. Um, Ian, what do you think about the kind of uniquely economic value of, of marriage in this whole um, set of three steps. Yeah. <clears throat> Once again, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Sorry, I can't be there in person. You know, this question of marriage uh, run uh, schools in the heart of the South Bronx, north side of Manhattan, last decade. Now I'm launching a new high school in the in the network. Two thousand income students primarily. Panic, 5,000 on the wait list, desperate for an opportunity to take that first uh, to achieve success. So something definitely in this conversation, barriers can allow kids to get pathway in the first place. But one of the things that so appealed to young people about education, work, and children, they feel that it's within their path. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, and, and seeing this information, that knowing that this school is something very, very practical. So for a lot of young people, it's just like, wow, regardless of my situation, here's a path of a marriage that can lead to likely different problems. And one who's it, to what's happening in these. You know, we just got for 20. I'm particularly in data for 24 because that age was approximate to in high school, college, and non married age for women 24 and under in the year 2020 was 72. It was 90. 92 in the black community and 62 in the white community. Mm. And there is a correlation in those of very high birth rates to women 20 and poverty, lack of education. So for a lot of young the the, the pot of marriage uh, create a set of positive possibilities. Hey, and yeah. one we can't really hear you right now. Your internet connection is pretty spotty, so we're gonna come back in, in a little bit and, and see if we can get a better connection to your internet, okay? Okay. Thank you. Um, so the, the next question is, you know, why is it so difficult for us, and you alluded, I think, to, to a second ago, Delano, why is it so difficult for us to talk about um, the success sequence, and again, marriage in particular, um, in many elite venues, um, in the media, you know, in our universities or public schools, um, and to kind of depict it, you know, in, a, in an honest way in the pop culture. Any thoughts? I'll start with you, Delon. Any thoughts about why it's difficult for us to talk about this in certain kinds of elite venues? Sure. Um, as I said, one is the perception that doing so, promoting marriage, and, and, and let me be specific, promoting you know, what we call the nuclear family, sometimes I call the natural family, so one man, one woman, one, one lifetime, um, that is seen as a, you know, reinforcing sort of cultural hegemony. Um, and particularly when you, when you talk about it in that context, it leaves out other types of you know, uh, unions and arrangements that, particularly on the, on the left, tend to take up a lot of space and a lot of attention. Uh, it's, it's the notion of moralizing, and particularly as you, 
if we're talking about um, the benefits of the success sequence to black and Hispanic young adults, it's both demoralizing and the uh, perception that talking about what they can control takes attention away from the larger structural and systemic forces. So I, I hear this you know, a lot. Um, I think all of those are, are, are reasons. And then honestly, there, there is an entire industry built around you know, notions of, of equity, of systemic racism, of, of structural racism that would begin to crumble if we pursued an agency agenda with the success sequence as its cornerstone. Because if, if I get to the point where I'm not just you know, telling my kids, if I'm a you know, success sequence John the Baptist type of person, <laughs> and I'm out there, you know, I'm on the road and like a wild-eyed man, and I'm saying, dude, if you do these three things, you'll avoid poverty. That's taking bread out of the mouth of Robin DiAngelo and Ibram Kendi and the people who say that, no, the way to improve the uh, social and financial condition of the black community is for white people to be better and for our federal government to be bigger. So these, these two messages really do collide. And I think that's part of the reason there's a lot of uh, resistance to it. As I said, uh, but I, I want to know something. The people who resist it practice it in their own lives. And I, and I think that's one of the things that needs to be focused on over and over again. I, I've said this before, you know, in other venues, um, the who's your daddy DNA truck does not drive around Martha's Vineyard. I can, I can guarantee <laughs> you that, or Georgetown for that matter. So uh, I, I think it's a combination of those things, right? The, the, the moralizing factor and the other sort of systemic and structural uh, factors as well. Catherine, your experience, why is it difficult to talk about family structure in academic contexts, for instance? For instance, I, I just, I think everything that, um, that Delano just said is, is like spot on. The only thing I guess I could add maybe is, um, you know, uh, so, you know, spoke about a certain kind of progressive attitude towards certain things, the concern that there's a, there's a, p a potential for um, a, 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 a speaking about, about these things, which looks discriminatory. Um, and, you know, so these are all concerns. But the, the thing that, I want to maybe highlight a little bit is that a lot of times people, people who are successful don't understand the components of their own success, right? Mm. So this is a piece of this kind of attitude, like, you know, people say, well, check your privilege, you know, <laughs> is as though the privilege was the, pro you know, but in fact, you know, it's difficult to figure out precisely how privilege plays a role. It's not that it's impossible. Um, but I think there's a lot of us, um, we, we're all guilty of this in a sense, right, which is that, um, you know, failing to understand and to recognize the, the ingredients in our own success um, and not crediting the right things. So in that sense, you know, there's, there's an ignorance that, um, and you know how it is, you know, when you're successful, you're not looking around to sort of like look who to, who to praise, right? When you're successful, it's your success. When things go wrong, you, you are definitely looking for someone mm -hmm. to blame or a system mm -hmm. to blame. So I, I think that may be part of it as kind of a human, um, human tendency to, uh, to not understand or not look for the, the, the other things to credit and to give thanks for, for our successes. Yeah. Ian, I know you've kind of dealt with this issue too in talking with educators about the success sequence. Um, so let me just kind of expand the question this way. Like, number one, why do you think the success sequence can be hard to kind of advance among many educators today? Um, and then yet, what do you kind of see when you talk about you know, these kinds of issues with uh, parents, for instance, in the South Bronx, um, and also, what do we see in the new uh, report from AI on the sort of uh, public attitudes about the success sequence that might maybe respond to some of the educators' concerns about this uh, approach? Yes, and thank you. Hopefully, you can hear me now. Uh, one, of the, one of the challenges, certainly I think, was that there was a fear on the part of educators in speaking with young people about following the sequence or just sharing the data was that there was a fear might somehow insult or demoralize young people because their parents may not have, uh, or married like did not follow the best sequence in their own life. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to be mm -hmm. perceived as imposing their middle 
value on to low income kids where they thought that the test sequence would somehow be insulting proposition. Hmm. But what we found was in fact the exact opposite, was that when we spoke to parents, particularly parents who, hmm. who may have had, uh, uh, were, had birth outside of math experience poverty, their response, thank heaven, someone speaking to my children about this data, because I wish someone would talk to me about that hmm. when I was much younger. And one of the things that's so important that if this is taught in high school, it's taught in descriptive fashion and not prescriptive, mm -hmm. meaning that you're not, not saying, look, not 100 percent, it's 97. <laughs> now, what are the likely rewards or consequences associated with different series of life decisions? As the report shows, there are different problems. You do all three, 97, 96% of the time, avoid poverty. But high school, not getting work, then there are different comes. So it's this, to a young person, what we're trying to do is empower you with information so that you can better inform decision when you were thinking about relationship, work, timing of information. So I think those are the concerns that I think educators have expressed, but really the very people who would most benefit information in the first place. And they want to know. And I think it will be a disservice and irresponsible to deprive young people of this information. Brad, can I go ahead? Jump um, in. Yep. Add something really quick. So I'm, I'm glad Ian brought up that example because uh, some of the, 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 the administrators and teachers are, as he said, reluctant to, to talk about the success sequence in marriage specifically because they don't want to offend parents. Mm -hmm. But in those same schools, when you come in through the door, You'll see Harvard and Florida AMU, and you'll see Yale and uh, Penn, and you'll see Cornell. You'll see every university with a little flag up on the wall because the schools, from the time the children are five years old, are reinforcing a particular message. We want you to go to college. And they're doing it in neighborhoods where the vast majority of parents have not gone to college. Yeah. And they don't have a problem with promoting that type of mm -hmm. ideal. Um, so my argument would be, okay, you know, as, as you talk to parents and, and think about how you want to interact with children, what types of things do we want our children to strive for? Mm -hmm. And I think particularly in light of some of the things we've been seeing in the news today, the, the challenges around you know, young men um, in their adolescence and what happens when they have a sense of hopelessness, when they lack identity and purpose, this is yet another thing you're talking about mm -hmm. your son where... Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you give a boy and a, and a man um, a sense of identity, a sense of purpose, a mission, a job to do, um, you, you give him something to strive for. But, and, and, and again, going back to specifically, you know, black and, and Hispanic communities, I've heard young men say that in my neighborhood, it's a major accomplishment to get to 25 years old. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, when that is your framework, mm -hmm. that is your, your perspective on life, you're not thinking generationally. Um, and, and that perspective may make it a, a lot more likely that you'll engage in you know, impulsive behavior that can end, end up you know, with you in, in trouble, in jail, or, or dead, to be quite frank. So I, I think it's one of these things where we're, we are already being prescriptive when it comes to, to parents and families. And I'll, I'll say this last piece, and, I, and I'll stop. The last two years have shown me that because I have heard since June of 2020 that you must do this. You must wear a mask. You must take a vaccine. And if you don't, you are a bad person. It's not here are these options available to you. Choose which ones you want. Mm -hmm. It's take this medication or you're a bad person. Mm -hmm. You're going to kill your grandmother and your children. And, and we don't want that. So my thing is, I would argue that, you know, uh, Intact families, strong families, 
uh, present and involved, not just physically and financially, emotionally involved fathers uh, provide much more protection for the long-term health and well-being of their children than any medication coming out of the FDA. So I think we should think about how we, not, not how, which things we want to promote, because it, that's always the, the, the issue. It's, it's never whether, it's always which mm -hmm. things. So I'll, I'll leave it there. So we've actually got a question that kind of touches on a related theme. It's sort of talking about the, the shortage, um, that labor shortage that many people are experiencing, uh, many employers are experiencing today. And we've also noticed, you know, at least over time, a kind of decline in the number of young men who are um, working, um, who are in the labor force uh, or working full time. Um, are there things that we could kind of do that would help young men in particular um, realize that second step when it comes to work? Now, Catherine, you talked about kind of keeping marriage in mind. That's certainly <laughs> one answer. But are there other things that come to mind for any of the panelists, either for you, Ian, up there in New York, or for Delano, or for Catherine? Um, you know, things that you think we could be doing to reconnect, uh, particularly younger men, to the labor force. What, what else can we do um, on that second step of the success sequence? Well, I, I, I think this is a, is a very good question because one of the criticisms of the success sequence is that it's so simple. You make it sound simple, don't deal with barriers that make a challenge for young people to get on each one of the rungs. So one of the things doing that I'm doing in New York, that I'm launching new uh, international baccalaureate high school uh, in the Bronx, focus. But one of the things interesting that at the sophomore year, uh, each student will be able to choose uh, one of one will traditional or university pathway, the other what's called the career pathway, where they choose a degree like computer science, uh, healthcare, early discussion clinic about a course of study in phlebotomy, uh, slash architecture, or media. One of those four, and we're gonna part companies. So at the end of two years, senior year, a student could with an influential labor market. So if they choose, they could enter the workforce right away. And I think it's just a mission within the case and especially a high school experience, we have to create more career path options so as to give young people more choice because not every the right answer to college immediately. So that would be a way to make it easier for young young men in to be able to access the component that sequence. Yeah. I, I think um, a, a big part of this would be a, a shift in how we talk about education and employment. As I said before, we've been completely on the, the college track for decades now. And, I, and I'm not against college. Obviously, everybody here has got you know, tons of education. But um, not only do we not talk about the trades, vocational arts, when we do talk about them, we talk about them as, well, well if you can't get into college, well, just go to, go to trade school. Right, so we don't talk about those types of, of jobs with, we don't imbue them with the same type of dignity. Yeah. Um, I think that's a mistake. I grew up in, in New York, um, the son of you know, immigrants from, from the Caribbean, and I'd say 80% 80, 80 of the men that I knew growing up worked with their hands. Mm -hmm. They were electricians, they were carpenters, they were plumbers, they were masons, um, and they would take us along mainly to do demolition work because it's a different skill to destroy than it is, than it is to build. Um, but, but that work was valuable. Nowadays, a lot, of, a lot of teenage boys, the only thing that they have in their hands is a video game controller. Um, and they're not thinking about building games, it's just they play them all day long. So I think a, a re-emphasis on, on the vocational arts, um, both through the pen, the purse, and, and the pulpit, Right? So just talking about the importance of those things, um, I think would, would go a, a long way. And as I said, um, young men need to hear about the types of things that they can do, and it, and it can't just stop at college. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just going to go right ahead and 
build on that, which I couldn't agree with more, but I'll, maybe I'll be more extreme, which is safe for an academic. <laughs> so, um, which is to say, for me, if you, know, if you gave me the pen and I could make the rules, I mean, I would take them from age 12 up through high school, and I would cut formal schooling in half of the day and allow pathways for young men especially um, to connect to, to work um, much earlier. So as a parent of, of several boys, one of the things you see in, in male development um, as, as boys are growing from boys into young men is you see that for, for most of them, there's a, there's a kind of sweet spot. There's an age um, where they do become obsessed with certain kinds of things. It's the age when they start memorizing sports statistics, you know, and the sorts <laughs> of things like age. I cannot get my head into. Mm -hmm. But it, it sort of, you know, there's this kind of, or the, you know, the kids that you can't get them out of the Lego bin at a certain age. Um, or, you know, the one son of mine that was always out, you know, looking under rocks and dirt. And that is an age which is really special. And what we do is we, A, we block them mm. from doing a lot of that. We, like, we, this natural thing when they want to become obsessed with how things work and how you could build things and what connections there are in the physical world, we take them and put them in a desk the whole day. And mm. then maybe on a bus on the two ends of that and then maybe into an aftercare program. Mm. Okay, so that... I think is terrible for the development of the experience of the uh, the pleasure of work, right? The the pleasure of work because I don't think there's an enormous like I've got a son who's studying engineering, but he was a Lego maniac for all mm. those years. I I see those as the same thing, right. but I just let that I let him lean into that Lego thing, you know. It was hours and hours and hours. Um, so for disadvantaged youth who maybe didn't have the things at home, the buckets of Legos, the mom there who could let them go into that. But in the school system, we may need to think about ways in which we could cut back on some of the formal education. That will get, people will scream and complain. They'll say, well, they're not already doing this. But maybe, maybe we can get to that goal actually by letting the boys um, lean into that natural space. I think that would go a long way uh, yeah. towards... Um, developing in them the sense of the pleasure of work. But, but part of, it's hard to do that because our policymakers yeah. and the people who shape and influence our culture um, have inverted sort of the, the way they think about gender versus race. Yeah. Our race conversations yeah. take place as if there are certain things that by nature, yeah make us different, regardless, you know, across ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to gender, the same people say, no, we're all the same there. Yeah. So they have it completely backwards. Yeah. I, have, I have three kids. I have, my oldest is a, is a girl. I have six, three, and two years old. Yeah. So I'm, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. Okay. You, but <laughs> even at two, two and three years old, the way that my boys yeah. interact with me yeah. is, one, different in the way my daughter yeah. did, and it's different in the way they interact with their mom. Yeah. So it's clawing, scratching, punching, biting, that type of thing. And yeah. my job as their dad is to cut with the grain, not to say, yeah. well, your sister came along first, mm -hmm. and she's happy sometimes sitting down, and, and so you must do the same things. Yeah. And, and that's exactly how yeah. our education has been formulated, um, I, yeah. I think, for the last yeah. couple of years. And I'll say this really quickly. I was actually on a call on my day job, which I don't talk about. Um, <laughs> And it was talking about education and, I, and restorative justice in education. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I came away with um, was it was the, the, the feminine imprint on education is crystal clear. And I'm not saying that's entirely a bad thing, but at 12 years old, if you told me I had to come and sit in a healing circle mm -hmm. and talk about my feelings <laughs> and... I wouldn't know what to do. So, yeah. so I think we, we have to, to get back to understanding yeah. that it's okay that boys and girls are different. Yeah. We should try to um, empower them to do the things that they love and not say, you know, the best way that a boy can be a boy is for him to be more like a girl and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So the, the last question here is, what's the best way to disseminate the success of Ekin's message to young adults? And um, Ian, your connection is, is still kind of iffy, but if you could give us just a very quick response in terms of your perspective, how can we do a better job or the best job of disseminating this message about the success sequence to young adults? I think one of, 
one of the best ways is to disseminate the information in schools. Mm -hmm. And there's actually curricula uh, that I've in my new book, Agency, for exact a curriculum for how uh, the success sequence can be taught in schools in a fashion. But let me also say that school choice is really important. In the district where schools, only 2% of this kid started ninth grade, four years graduate school ready for college, meaning that they drop along the way, or they do earn their high school diploma, but still can't nor reading without remediation. So this whole idea, and there's a cap on schools, so you couldn't open brand new school. So again, this how to help get on the rung in the place has to be part of the conversation. So schools are obviously the faith community to even more authority, talk about the school work, and importantly, math. Great. Um, Catherine, what, what do you think we can do to disseminate the success sequence message to young adults today? Uh, yeah, so the first thing I was going to say is I think work with churches. Uh, I've been going to church my whole life, and I don't think from a normal pulpit on a regular Sunday, I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about this. Uh, now, people talk about marriage, and, you know, marriage is a good thing, but they're, you know, they're philosophizing about a passage in the Bible. That's not a bad thing, but they don't connect it to, to ordinary life very often. So, I mean, I think working with churches, I wonder sometimes if that's not uh, an omission based on you know, fear. They don't want to, they're not, they're not, they're afraid to talk about it, but they, but our pastors oftentimes don't have this information. Mm. Right. So making sure that we work with churches on this, I think. And then in the, and you know, it's sort of, sort of building on the, one of the first things I said is um, in some of the way we promote the success sequence, maybe down the line, additional materials uh, is really highlight the way in which this is, um, this is something that you do for yourself, but also you do for all the others yeah. that will depend upon you. So, and not to be afraid to appeal to their sense of um, generosity and the vision of the family they want to have and what they think their children might be like. Um, I think that can be very powerful. And we're coming out of many decades. I mean, I know when I was in high school, the messaging that I received was always very self-centered. It was like, you know, this is the way you're going to get into elite college. This is the way you're going to, you know... I was like, okay, you know, I mean, I, I would say like all the safe sex programs are similar. They really, they, they try to appeal to your sense of self-interest. But I think young people are, are seriously other-oriented. Mm. And in a sense, they, they want to be heroic. They want to do cool things for the future and for other people. Um, so I think those are two things that could help uh, work with churches and appeal to the, the, the natural gift that, that pe young people want to be to their loved ones. So the sequencing messaging, just to summarize what yeah. you're saying, should be kind of stressing not just self-interest, yes. but the way in which it allows you to serve, you know, yeah. the welfare of others, you know, other adults in yeah. your relationship um, and any kids you might have, and then even obviously the common good as well. Yeah, if you follow this sequence, your kids will not grow up in poverty, and that's, that's actually a way worse calamity, yeah. right, than, than me being in poverty. I think people do think that way. It's, yeah. it's an empowering way because... I think many kids like the idea of what they call two generational solutions. Mm. Mm -hmm. That sequence a two generational solution. Yeah. And the more that we in that con could resonate with people of, of all the spectra. Yeah. So um, I, I think about this question a lot, actually. I think we should use every single tool available um, in the tool belt. So that is persuasion, coercion, <laughs> shame. And when I say that, I mean, so for instance, again, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it, particularly in the ethnic context. I want to be able to take this data, right, as solid as it is, take the graphics, everything, take it to the NAACP, and ask them, why is it that they don't promote this, but they do PSA campaigns telling um, C-less actors that no black person has ever seen, unless they are into rom-coms, by the way. <laughs> and they say, 
the NAACP, NAACP partners with those people and say, we're taking responsibility for racism. I want to say to Derek Johnson, the president and CEO of the NAACP, no, your message to our community should be, fathers, take responsibility for your homes. Mm -hmm. So that's a shame. Mm -hmm. And if he says, no, I don't, I don't want to do that, that's OK. I have something for you. Let me go on <laughs> you know, wherever, whatever, network, and, and say NAACP won't take this. Um, so persuasion, um, I think we should use it when we talk to, to academics, um, mm -hmm. obviously present company, not, mm -hmm. not included. <laughs> but the, one, the types that, that talk in um, such nuance that after a while you say, is this nuance or is this ob obfuscation? Right? The, the message, the definitions of the terms, you, you say um, the black community can't progress until we dismantle white supremacy. Well, I understood what that meant 20 years ago, but now white supremacy is the nuclear family. Mm -hmm. So I want to be able to say, look, we have something. Um, uh, high school graduation or college graduation is measurable. Uh, mm -hmm. Economic activity, mm -hmm. right? Workforce participation is measurable. Marriage is measurable. All three things I can measure and say, in 20 years, I want to be here. White supremacy, again, any given week, you have a different definition. Um, dis dismantling systemic racism, de different definition. So I, I think we should use every lever of policy, of culture, public awareness campaigns, teaming up with professional sports leagues, um, again, coercing big tech, mm -hmm. big media, uh, all of those you know, instruments, again, of policy and culture need to be engaged because many people on the left and the right agree that our, our families are really struggling. They may disagree on the reasons, but I think having something where we can say, if, as everyone has said, if you, do the, if you follow these three steps, mm -hmm. right? They're simple, but they're not easy, but they're mm -hmm. simple to understand and remember. Your chances of being, pover in, being in poverty um, by your mid-30s are gonna be in single digits. That is a powerful message. Mm -hmm. And I think we should use every tool available to get it you know, where, where it needs to be. Great. Well, on that note, I'm going to thank our guests. We've got uh, Ian Rowe, my colleague here at AI, joining us from New York. Thanks, <laughs> Ian, for being with us tonight. We've got Delano Squire from Blaze TV in the center here, mm -hmm. and Catherine Pakolik from uh, Catholic University. I'm grateful for you all joining us tonight, and wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.